Good morning, everyone. In the Bible, days have, uh, days have various terms or names. Until the fifth day, they just call first day, second day, third day, fourth day, and so on. But when it comes to today, this day has a name. The name is Preparation Day. It's not called anymore by number. It's called as the Preparation Day. I think you have an idea why. That tomorrow or this evening will be Sabbath and today is Preparation Day. We had the week of prayer the past few days. And because it's Preparation Day, we have one session this morning, this afternoon, and tomorrow will be the end of the sessions of the week of prayer. Have you been blessed? Have you been blessed? I have been personally blessed. Especially, I always sit in that corner there. Yung mga katabi ko dyan, bababait lahat eh. Kung babae ako, then I will also sit in that corner. I also meet the mababait na mga babae on that corner. I'm sure in all corners of PIC, there are the good ones who come to this week of prayer and have been blessed. That's my perspective as I sit in that corner. How about you, Christine? Good morning student. first, mm. doctor. Good morning, students. Wow, I cannot just express how much blessed I've been, especially that in a semester, there is one week for spiritual emphasis. And we are very much fortunate to have that one week with God. But it must never end here, right, Doc? It must always continue and progress. And as a student, I've been challenged through this week of prayer not to stop knowing God. It must be a daily intimate relationship with Him. So this week had been a week of growing, huh? learning. Not growing in terms of uh, pounds, <laughs> but in terms of spiritual growth, in terms of maturity, and I believe that we have grown a lot this week and we praise the Lord. You know, brothers and sisters, preparing a week of prayer is not an easy task, especially for students of the Adventist University of the Philippines. Kasi magagaling lahat. They listen carefully. When they go back to the dorms, they comment on the songs, on the comments. Imagine commenting on the comments. They comment on the comment of the presiders. They talk about many, many things. They talk about the messages, which is good in many ways. Because they even it means sing that, the song. Huh? They even sing the song again. Oh, they even sing the song. Yes, sir. By the way, that's why our youth ministry department has produced a CD of all the Week of Prayer songs the past few years. So they have been displaying it at the lobby for several days. So they comment on the songs. Huh? There is what they call LSS, the last song syndrome. Oh. And when I go back to the dormitory, it is the song they sing, the appeal song. Oh, the appeal song. The young men should learn that, the appeal song. Yeah, so that they know how to make an appeal. Huh? Hey, ah, tell okay. us. So appeal song. You know, so preparing all of this, the appeal song, the prayers, the sermons, had been a lot of work. And today, as the as a representative of the administration, I also want to say thank you to all of the young people, the leaders, the associates of Pastor Diaz and Lyser here, who prepared. May I request all of the staff of the week of prayer who please stand up. I know you are hiding in the shadows. Will you please stand up? We would like to appreciate you. Thank you so much. Those, the young, the assistants on the camera that you only see their backs, not their faces. They're part of the team. Those who work at the back, uh, background, the ante room, preparing everything. Those who compose the song. This had been a wonderful week, and we praise the Lord for all of the preparations. At this point, we would like to call Pastor Diaz and Lyser, I believe. I'm not sure who's coming up. This is the time for us to recognize the speakers. I'm sure their digestions had been affected because of the, what do you call that, Christine? 
the juices, what do you call that, that, produce, that are produced when you are stressed? Yes, sir. Huh? Okay, the yes, yes. juices. Yes, Paul. Or maybe we should call it the no, I'm, yeah. no, no, I'm a speaker. Yeah? The no juices. Anyway, they produce the juices, their love life are affected. Yeah, their routine, many things. sir. Huh? Their routine, of course, it's been affected. Their routine, uh, many things. But we praise the Lord that the Lord, the Spirit, used them to give the messages for us. How many of you have been blessed by the messages that your fellow students had prepared? May I see your hands, please? Praise the Lord. Thank you. So let me give the time now to our leaders as they uh, they introduce and they lead us in the appreciation section of the first part of our program this morning. Hello. So, in behalf of PIC and AYM officers, we would like to acknowledge our speakers this week of prayer 2015. So, let me read the citation. So, um, if I have called on your, your name, please come up here in front. Adventist University of the Philippines, Philippine International Church, Adventist Youth Ministries presents this Certificate of Appreciation to Jeremy Davao for accepting the call to be God's instrument in appealing an invitation to be part of God's family. Through preaching His Word during the week of spiritual emphasis with the theme, Heirs. Given this 20th day, of November 2015 at Philippine International Church, Adventist University of the Philippines, Putinkahoy, Silang, Cavite. Sign, AY Leader, PIC, Lyser Jake Aligato. Youth Pastor, PIC, Jaisal May Diaz. Senior Pastor, PIC, Rex Mangiliman. Spiritual Life Director, AUP, Abel Vergara. Daniel Castillo. Owen Jokna. Abner Faina. Joseph Andrews. Esther Imperio. Chiari Alcantara. Andy Julian Francis. Ishmael Ferry. Paul De Jesus, Ravel Jean Pablo, Again, on behalf of the university, we would like to thank all of you, the speakers, for your hard work. We thank, we praise the Lord that the Spirit had used you to be a blessing to our community, not only to your fellow students, but also to your teachers as well. May God continue to bless you as you use, his ta you use your talents for His honor and glory. Thank you so much. 
Thank you. Before uh, Christine and I go down, we just want to have one announcement. Those of you who have decided to be baptized, to be part of God's people, uh, to be signified by a baptism tomorrow, please approach the pastoral staff. Uh, so that they can orient you and prepare you for the baptism. Thank you so much. Good morning, AUP. We're, we will sing our theme song this morning, but um, at the end, we want this side to sing, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God, and you gentlemen will sing the theme song. Got it? Okay. Stand. Good morning, everyone. For a season of prayer this morning, 
Our prayer focus is about God giving us wisdom for guidance in making right decisions. Our prayer thought is from one of the writings of Ellen White. It says, We must daily commit our ways to God in faith and be learning continually of Christ Jesus. He will not leave us to walk in darkness, but will give us enlightenment of the Holy Spirit. Let every decision be made after prayer and faithful study. We need to cultivate the spirit of prayer that all our plans may be laid wisely and in the fear of God. For the sequence of our season of prayer, first we will all kneel and the song leader will lead a song that will tune our hearts in the atmosphere of prayer. Then we will be given three minutes to have a private talk with God. After which, a song will be sung once more, indicating that the time is up. And lastly, Mom Wilhelm Fisalbon will conclude the prayer. Um, I invite the congregation to please kneel as we pray. Sweet Jesus, sweet Jesus, what a wonder you are, you are brighter. And come on. 
decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning Our Father, we praise you because you have given us the confidence that if we ask anything according to your will, you will hear us. This morning, Lord, we are asking for the Holy Spirit to be in us because this morning, all of us will be making decisions big and small. And we ask, Lord, that when your word is given to us, our hearts will respond according to your will. We will respond that our lives, our hearts, our minds, and our hands will give glory to your name. Thank you, dear God, for hearing and answering our prayers. We ask all of these things in the loving name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.
Thank you for that wonderful song. Good morning, everyone. How are you today? I know that you are excited this morning because from the previous days, we had been talking about how to be heirs of God, heirs of His salvation, and heirs of His kingdom. From the previous days, we have talked about Adam, Isaac, and also Moses, also Esther. But today, brothers and sisters, friends, let us thank God because we will know of a person, another servant of God, a youth just like you and me, a person who has no great accomplishments in the eyes of the ungodly, but for us, we consider him as one of the pillars of our faith. Brothers, it's always best to ask for the Holy Spirit before we get into the study of His words. So I invite everyone to please bow your heads as I pray. Let us pray. Our God, Heavenly Father, truly Lord, You are divine and holy. We as Your sons and daughters are here in front of You kneeling before you, O God. Accept us just as you have accepted Jesus Christ. For the sake of the blood that he spilled on the cross, cleanse us, O God. We acknowledge your presence here more so, o Father, in this house of prayer. And we would like to experience and witness the miracles that you will do in our lives this morning. Oh God, I can't believe this is happening to me. So great a crowd of people hungering about the truth. Lord, I'm not, I'm not deserving, but all I need is you, I know, oh God. Help me to divide the word accordingly. And also, oh God, help me to lift up Jesus Christ and you alone be exalted and our faith edified. I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, this morning, I entitled my message, the title of my message is this, Wise Unto Salvation. That's it. Wise unto salvation. Today, we will be talking about a person whose, whose name means one who honors God or one who is honored by God. Let me ask you this question. Were you named after a person, after someone else? Does your name have a special meaning? Does your name reflect a spiritual quality that you value. Now this person whose name means one who honors God, I believe by looking into the life of this person, we will glorify and we will exalt not the servant but the master who, is the, who the servant is serving. Now, do you have any idea who this person is? Do you have any idea? Well, his name is Timothy. Yes, Timotheus. That is his name in Greek. And let us consider his name in Greek. The, timo, the prefix Timo means honor. And the Theos, God. So he, he got his name from that word. So his name literally means one who honors God. You know, friends, brothers and sisters, I never had so much idea about this man until I was appointed to speak to you regarding this event today. You know, all I know about Timothy is that he is a youth. Yes, he's a youth, a follower of Paul. His mother is a Jewess. His Greek, his his father is a Greek. That's all I know. But I never know that 
this person grow into the knowledge and the grace of Jesus Christ. You know, before preparing this sermon, I looked for some references, and I thought of a word that will best describe this man. And you know what is that word I have thought about? This word. That word is youth. Yes, that word is youth. That is the best word that will describe him as a person. That, yes, that's, that word is youth. And you know, I was so excited. And when I looked to search for, the, for his name in the LNG White application, I entered his name and I was, I was surprised that it was Timothy who first appeared in the hit list. And then I began to be excited about knowing this man. And I think it's best to begin by looking into the early, earliest accounts of his life. Well, Luke was the first person who introduced to us Timothy. He said in Acts 16 verse 1, And behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed. But his father was Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. Notice here, friends, about the characteristics of Timothy and his mother. Luke describes his mother as a, as a woman who believed. And you know what he believed about? Yes, he believed about the gospel. He believed about Jesus Christ. He believed that Jesus Christ was the coming Messiah. And notice here Luke's opinion about Timothy. He said he was well spoken by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. Here is a map to help you to understand the location of the place of Timothy. You see the black line there? That is Paul's first missionary journey. And that is where Timothy lives, that town called Lystra. And so, Paul, on his second missionary journey, was able to pass by again this place in their town. And that is when he found Timothy. And you know, after knowing that Timothy is well-spoken, by the brethren at Iconium and Lystra, Paul did not think twice but to take Timothy with him in his second missionary journey. Now, let us take a look about the home of this young man. Here is a picture to describe you. This is a picture had of what an artist had in mind about the family of Timothy. Yes, what you can see is that his mother there teaching to him the scriptures and also his grandmother there. You know, brothers and sisters, inspiration tells us about the life of Timothy. And it says, we see the advantage that Timothy had in a correct and example of piety and true godliness. Religion was the atmosphere of his home. And it says, the manifest spiritual power of the piety in the home kept him pure in speech and free from all corrupting sentiments. It continues, it says, from a child, Timothy had known the scriptures. What did he say once again from a child? Timothy had known what? The scriptures. He had the benefit of the Old Testament scripture and the manuscript of the part of the New Testament, the teachings and the lessons of Christ. Maybe some of us today here, when we are young, we first learned about the ABC, the alphabet. Or maybe we have this, we have this, 
coloring books of Hello Kitty. Maybe when we are young, we have first learned about Stitch. We have first learned about Doraemon. But this man, as inspiration tells us, from a child, thou hast known, or from a child, Timothy had known the Holy Scriptures. Brothers and sisters, parents, I would like to tell you, this can't be done without you cooperating with the Holy Spirit. Oh, how I wish that someday my wife will introduce to, me, to, to my son, Jesus Christ, before introducing anyone else. You see, from a child, Timothy had known the Scriptures. In fact, that word, child, actually this was extracted by Sister White from 2 Timothy 3.16. That word, child, means, in Greek rendering, it's, it means brephus. And you know what brephus means? It means fetus, unborn child, an infant, a babe. You see, from infancy, from infancy, Timothy had known the Scriptures. What we can notice is that his mother and his grandmother has passed a heritage of rich Bible study to Timothy. And you know, when you notice in the Bible, those persons who were instructed in their homes, we found out that later in their life, they, be they became those giants in faith. We can name many of them, like Moses, Joseph, even Samuel, and of course, Jesus. The Spirit of Prophecy tells us that Mary instructs Jesus Christ about the Bible since he was a child. And now, upon hearing that Timothy had a good reputation coming from the char church, Paul took him to be a missionary companion in his second missionary journey. You know, the Scripture tells us the piety that he saw in his home life was sound insensible. The faith of his mother and his grandmother in the sacred oracles was to him a constant reminder of the blessing in doing God's will. The word of God was the rule by which these two godly women had guided Timothy. The spiritual power of the lessons that he had received from them kept him pure in speech and insulted by the evil influences with which he was surrounded. Thus, it says, his home instructors had cooperated with God in preparing him to bear the burdens in ministry. Parents, you can't just expect that your children will, lead, will love Jesus more than what you do today unless you live in front of them a life of truth, Christianity. Here, we find out that Timothy, from his infancy, known the Scriptures. But let me ask you, let me ask you this. Timothy, in his young mind, his mother is a Jew, his father is a Greek. He may have been baffled about the differing beliefs of his mother and his father. You know why? As a child, he may have been confused of what to believe. As a Jew, his mother as a Jew believes that there is only one God. On the other hand, his father as a Greek believes that there are many gods and goddesses. As a Jew, his mother believes that God relates with men. On the other hand, his father believes that God is untouchable, never relates with men. Now you see, these beliefs of his mother and his father 
are of totally opposition with one another. And now here comes Paul introducing to him a new idea, introducing to him a new message about this Jesus Christ crucified on the cross. Timothy knew that the message of Paul is contradictory to what his mother and his father believes about. Well, you see, we find here, brothers and sisters, inspiration tells us in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 18, in fact, it says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And verse 21, it says, For since the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know Him, but God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached in order to save those who believe. It continues, Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called both the Greeks, both the Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now you see in the context of Timothy's life, he may have been confused about the message of Paul, although a good news introducing eternal life, but yet for him, if you were in his position, in his situation, Paul's message is of total contradictory to what he believes. But what we, can we say, see from here is that stumbling block to the Jews and for the Greeks, it's foolishness. The message that Paul preaches about Jesus being crucified on the cross is for them foolishness and for them a stumbling block. Why a stumbling block to the Jews? Why is the message about Christ being crucified on the cross a stumbling block for the Jews? Yes, Jews believe that Jesus is not the Savior. They believe that Jesus is just someone who is demon-possessed, cursed by God. And why foolishness to Gentiles? Gentiles believe that a person who is being crucified on the cross is a person considered as a notorious criminal. They don't believe that Jesus or that God in His deity would come to heaven, be crucified on the cross just for humanity's sake. For them, God may have been foolish. But you see from here, brothers and sisters, it says on the latter part of the text, but for those who believe, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now, let us examine how Timothy accepted Jesus Christ. Scripture tells us this. This is the secret of Timothy. From a child, thou hast fully known the Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. It says here that knowing the Scriptures is the secret of Timothy, and it made him wise unto salvation. Although the message of the gospel is contradictory to what he believes, but by studying the Scriptures, he was able to accept Jesus Christ and believe that He is His Savior. Brothers and sisters, friends, yes, we need the Bible. We need the Word. But we need Jesus Christ. But, wait, but my question for you this morning is that how many of us today takes the Bible as our standard of life? How many of us today would say the same statement just as David has said, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and the light unto my path. How many of us would pray for the Bible 
and will sing the same statement said in the song. Give me the Bible, holy message shining. Brothers and sisters, yes, we need the Bible for us to choose wise of what to believe. Now, Paul, knowing that Timothy has this kind of life, he took him in his missionary journey, and here, And here is a picture of how an artist describes how Timothy left his home and be with the Apostle Paul. It says, uh, uh, it's there. The image is there. What we can notice here, friends, is that Timothy is leaving home, right? Yes, he is leaving home, but he is leaving home not because he wants to run away from his family. He is leaving home because he is becoming a missionary companion to Paul. He is leaving home because he has known the purpose of his childhood training at home. He is leaving home because he knows that he has a mission to make. Well, brothers and sisters, let me ask you, how old then was Timothy? when he accompanied Paul in his second missionary journey. It says, it gives us a hint. When Timothy was little, more than a boy, Paul took him with him as his companion in labor. So I think by this description, using this description, you can picture out how old was Timothy? It says he was just little more than a boy. And you know, parents, would you just do your Proverbs 22, verse 6 duty to your parents, uh, to your children? God will not leave your effort unrewarded. It says here, in the, the inspiration tells us, those who had taught Timothy in his childhood were rewarded by seeing the son of their care linked in close fellowship with the great apostle. Yes, the joy, the joy that a mother or a father feels when they see that their son or daughter is working actively for the Lord. Brothers and sisters, here Timothy, now going with Paul in his second missionary journey. You know, it's hard to accept the request of Paul because still fresh in the mind of Timothy was the incident that happened to Paul when he first visited his place. You know what happened? Paul was almost stoned to death at his place. In fact, the Scripture, the Holy Spirit tells us in the inspiration, it says, Timothy had been converted through the ministration of Paul and was an eyewitness of the sufferings of Paul, upon this occasion, he stood by the apparently dead body and saw him arise, bruised and covered with blood, not with groans or murmurings upon his lips, but with praises to Jesus Christ that he was permitted to suffer for his name. You know, accepting the request of Paul, it was hard. You know why? Accepting the request of Paul also means that you are accepting to be in prison with him. Accepting the message, the invitation of Paul also means that you will also accept persecutions that will come on your way. Accepting the invitation of Paul also means accepting to live a life wholly consecrated to God. Brothers and sisters, but Paul, but Timothy, in his young mind, you know the tendency of a child is to be afraid, but he was not afraid. He accepted the challenge. He knows that God has a purpose in his life. And so, Timothy had been a missionary companion to Paul, and the Bible records to us that Paul with Timothy, roaming around the churches, ministering unto them. It says that the church's congregations, the numbers of the congregations are 
are increased daily. Yes, but yet, Timothy, in his life, he has to minister without, under the apostles' care. Then came the time when Paul was imprisoned, and he has his letter to the Philippians, and he wrote to the Philippians that he will send Timothy. And you know what did he wrote? He said, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state, for I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state, for all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus, but you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Now we see the recommendation of Paul to Timothy for the churches. Relating ourselves with this, time will come when you have graduated, you will go back to this school and ask for a recommendation from your dean for you to be accepted to the work that you want to apply. Do you know the recommendation? Most of us are asking for high, to be highly recommended but to be highly, highly recommended means also that you must have a good reputation. It says here in the message of Paul to the Philippians, actually Paul is telling to us in his recommendation about Timothy that Timothy is someone who is like-minded with him. You see the discipleship training that Paul had he has transferred it to Timothy. He was actually, he actually developed and produced someone who is just the same with him. This tells us about Timothy's reputation, about his caliber of doing the ministry for the Lord, and it also tells us the opinion of the churches for Timothy. Brothers and sisters, when Paul was in prison, Timothy has to minister by himself. Yes, he has to minister by himself. Not anymore under the care of this great apostle Paul, his mentor. But I tell you, brothers and sisters, but he was always under the care of God. Now you see, Paul, knowing that Timothy will become now a church leader at his young age, he wrote to Timothy this. He said in 1 Timothy 4 verse 12, Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, and in faith, and in purity. Now it's a odd thing to say since we don't have the control over what persons might think of us, but here it seems that Timothy was a victim of age discrimination. But notice what Paul was actually trying to say. He, what he means is that Timothy has to act maturely when it comes to his character. When it comes to wisdom, he has to be of greater wisdom. You know, some of us Reflecting this with myself as a minister, some of us would think, I'm too young for the ministry. Some of us would, would like that our beards will grow, our whiskers will grow. But you know, brothers and sisters, to be physically mature is not a standard that you, you can be a church leader. You have to be mature when it comes to wisdom, when it comes to character. And that's what was Paul was saying here. Timothy has to be mature. He must be an example to the believers in word and conduct and in purity. You know, I want to tell you, young friends, to be a youth, to be young, it's not a license to act stupidly. It is not a license 
to do some experimental behaviors. Well, in fact, Satan is doing his best for us to be like of this world, to think like of this world. But I tell you, brothers and sisters, in your age today, God can use you if effectively just like Timothy. You know, had Timothy let his heart distracted by the world in his days, he could have found himself leaving the ministry of God. Here is an advice for us. From the Inspiration Councils for the Church 344, Point five, it says, The highest aim of our youth should not be to strain after something noble. There was none of this in the mind and work of Timothy. They should bear in mind that in the hands of the enemy of all good, knowledge alone may be a power to destroy them. And that is the secret of Timothy. He has been made wise because of studying the words the knowledge about the grace, the knowledge of, about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's why, brothers and sisters, I would, I would like to ask you, is there, is there something more important? Is there something more happier than to be young? I tell you, yes, brothers and sisters. Much more to be young is to give all that strength, to give all that love of life to the relationship that we can ever have, to the best relationship that we can ever have. And that relationship is having the relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, brothers and sisters, in the life of Timothy, he was described as a minister who manifested the characteristics of Jesus Christ. In his life, we can see Jesus' faith. In his life, he took hold of the advice of Jesus Christ, which says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And the second one is like it, love the neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, considering that we will work for Christ and not for ourselves, brothers and sisters, we've got to think of what or where this will take us. You know, in his life, Timothy, because he was too young, Paul thinking that he needs some encouragement, it says to us, It says to us in 2 Timothy 1, verse 8 to 9. Now, Timothy, as a minister of Christ, as a minister of Christ, he has to suffer of whatever it may take him. Now, let me ask you, do you expect to go to heaven for nothing? Brothers and sisters, you know, realizing that he has to suffer with Christ, this man whose name is Peter of Alcantara, he said, I have made a contract with my body. It has promised to accept harsh treatment coming from me on earth, and I have promised that it shall receive eternal rest in heaven. Brothers and sisters, We've got to suffer for the Lord's sake. The same is with the encouragement of Paul to Timothy. He has to suffer with him. He has not to be ashamed of the gospel, but he has with all his strength and power carry out his mission unto all the world. Brothers and sisters, you know, friends, I admire those people who are willing to suffer just to reach 
something. They are willing to suffer just to reach, just to climb a mountain and reach its summit. Some are willing to suffer to join an Ironman competition where they are required to bike five miles, run 100 miles, and swim for about two miles. Brothers and sisters, some are willing to sacrifice their family just to keep themselves on the road. But you know, Paul is telling to us that there is something far more worthwhile suffering for, brothers and sisters. The gospel in the cross when Jesus Christ died is the most stunning manifestation of God's grace, inviting to us immortal life. Isn't it more worth suffering for? Brothers and sisters, I remember Jesus Christ. When He came here on earth, He has to suffer. He has to experience suffering on the cross. He has to wear that, that crown of thorns before wearing that crown of glory. And you know, I would like to tell you this morning, as long as we Christians exist here on earth, suffering will be will be always will always be there playing an integral part in our christian lives you know brothers and sisters friends sister white exclaimed we do not expect rest here no no the way to heaven is a cross bearing way the road is straight and narrow but we will go forward with cheerfulness knowing that the king of glory once trod this way before us we will not complain of the roughness of the way. But this seems to be contrasting with our lives today. Sometimes we experience small trials. Yes. But we easily complain to God. But Sister White tells us that we, we can't murmur because the way to eternal life is rough. But will be, but it says, but we'll be meek followers of Jesus, treading his footsteps. He said, we will not have a murmuring thought because we have trials. God's dear children always had them. And every trial well endured here will only make us rich in glory. She said, I crave the suffering part. She continued. I would not go to heaven without suffering if I could and see Jesus who suffered so much for us to purchase for us so rich an inheritance. Brothers and sisters, I would like to tell you, there is no cross, there is no crown wearing without cross bearing. No thorns, no thrones, no cross, no crowns. But just like Timothy, who chose Jesus Christ, we, as young people, we've got to choose. We've got to choose for ourselves on what to, be, to believe. But I would like to tell you, be wise just like Timothy. Comparing every belief with what has been said in the Scriptures, you know, many churches today, many denominations today claims that they are the family of Christ, that they are the body of Christ. But you cannot just, brothers and sisters, friends, you cannot just assume that a religion is just as good as the other. No, God has just one church. He has just one family. He has just one family of heirs of His salvation of whom Jesus Christ is the head. And how can you know that family? Nothing else would best tell you except by the Word of God. By the Word of God, you can know what family Jesus Christ have, has here on earth. Brothers and sisters, I would like to tell you, and I would like to share to you some descriptions that the Bible tells us about the family of heirs 
of Jesus Christ here on earth. It says, this family, according to the Bible, they are a church that possesses these distinctive doctrines in the, in the Bible as their beliefs. They believe about Jesus' second advent. They believe about the atoning sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, typified by the sanctuary in the wilderness. And they believe about the mediatorial, mediatorial service of Jesus Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. In short, the sanctuary doctrine. They are a church with a gift of prophecy. Therefore, they have a prophetic message and a prophetic mission. They proclaim the three angels' message to the world. They revere the seventh day as the Lord's Sabbath, and they keep the commandments of God. More so, friends, they uphold the sola scriptura principle and are known to be the church who takes God at His words. Now here, Now, here is a good recommendation for us. If you would like to find that family, it says here, St. Catherine Catholic Church Sentinel, May 21, 1995, it says, People who think that the Scriptures should be the sole authority should logically become Seventh-day Adventists. You know, friends, I was born to a Seventh-day Adventist family. My father and my mother were second-generation Adventists. You know, when I was a child, I have so much, I have many questions. I, 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 I was questioning myself, why are we Seventh-day Adventists and others are not? Why do we go to church on Saturdays while others go to church on Sundays? Why we don't eat pork and other foods? While on the other hand, some people just really don't care. They freely eat whatever they like. I was questioning why we read the Bible so much while others just don't care reading the Bible. I was questioning why we have this morning and evening worship daily while others do not worship at home. You know, brothers and sisters, later in life, I have understood that God's family who believes in Him should be uniquely different from those families who belong to this world. In my mind, back then when I was young, I understand that, I understood that we do not do what others do because God said it in the Bible. And you know, I don't take it as a loss. I don't take it as a regret that I have not experienced what others have experienced. Nevertheless, I praise God, brothers and sisters, that my family belongs to God's greater circle of families waiting for Jesus' return. And friends, to those of you, you may not have been born in a family having this kind of faith. You may have been born in a family where there is mixed faith, you may have been born into a family who believes of different beliefs. But I've got to tell you this morning, you can choose to believe and join the family of heirs. I've got to tell you, you have to choose and make that decision right now. When, when Joshua was leader of Israel after Moses, the people of Israel turned their faces against God. They began to worship idols. And now here is Joshua as the leader. He gathered every tribe, every elders of the Israelite nation. He gathered them in one place at Shechem. And he stood on a precipice of a stone saying with a loud voice this statement he said now therefore fear the lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness put away the gods that your father served before the river and in egypt and serve the lord he continued 
and if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, he said, choose you this day whom you will serve. Later, he exclaimed, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Yes, friends, we cannot serve God sincerely and faithfully unless we put away the idols that we have in our hearts. I know each of us have idols. Maybe it is a thing, an experience, a relationship. But I've got to tell you, you have to let go of those. You want to reach the hand of Christ, but you cannot let go of it. The advice of the message of this text says, put it away, put it away. Give it to Jesus Christ because He can carry it for you. Brothers and sisters, if you have that decision, you can say the same statement that Joshua said, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, as we hear the appeal song that our sister healer will sing, I would like you to think of yourself. I would like to think of your past life. Think of a life when Christ is not with you. Think of the most heaviest moment that may happen or that you may experience when Jesus Christ is not with you. Think of the saddest thing that might happen to you if you are not with Christ and then find purpose. Is there a purpose in your life without Jesus Christ? And I want you also to think about yourself. Think about Jesus when He is there, up there in the clouds of heaven and you are there ready to meet Him. How does your faith look like? Think of yourself and your family in a long line towards the city of God, wherein from a distance you can see Jesus Christ happily putting each crown on each head of the same. And you know that in a little while, it will be your turn. You will be standing in front of Jesus. You can look straight into His eyes. You can embrace Him if you want. I know He will be happy embracing you too. Think of yourself. Think of your dad, your mom, your sister, or your brother with bright crowns all aglow. Is there more happier experience than having our complete family there in heaven? Think of your life. Will there be purpose? when Jesus Christ is present in your heart. Brothers and sisters, let us close our eyes and let us hear the song. to be 
friends, in the life of Timothy, he has inherited something special, a heritage of Bible study. But now Paul, knowing that he will soon face death for the sake of Jesus Christ, introduces something, an inheritance to Timothy. He said in Timothy, in first, in second Timothy, he said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Paul, as a man, would encourage his son in faith to have this crown of life. So is our Lord God, our Father, this morning, wants to put a crown on your head, brothers and sisters. The Lord is calling us this morning. And I want to make an appeal to you. I have three appeals. First, to those people who would want a crown, who would want to wear a crown in heaven, who wants to be belong to the family of heirs of God's salvation, I want you to stand. I want you to stand. You know, the, the devil is so busy today. And you know what he is busy about? He has this hobby of collecting. Yes, he is a collector. But his collection is not just of some cheap stuff. He collects precious things. He collects, my friends, crowns of life. He collects crowns of life. But nowadays, you can see many are losing their crowns. Young and old, boys and girls, not because Satan took it away from them, not just because they have let Satan, but because they consciously surrender their crown on the feet of the enemy. Brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ said, His promise to us is this. In Revelation, He said, Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast to which you have, that no man take thy crown. Today, for those of you who want to serve the Lord, but you've got to choose. You have decided this morning to leave your past life, to leave those things that hinders you to coming into Jesus Christ, who wants to be belong to the church, the family of heirs, and who wants to accept Jesus Christ through the means of baptism as a renunciation of your love to Him. I want you to come here in front and gather on this side. Make that decision right now, brothers and sisters, friends. Give your heart to Jesus Christ. Don't let anyone take your crown. Please come in front. Gather in this place and let me pray for you. If you have this pondering in your heart that the Spirit is calling on the doors of your heart, knocking, don't harden your heart. Brother, sister, come to Jesus Christ. Accept Him. Please come in front and accept Jesus Christ with arms wide open. He is willing to embrace you and accept you. He wants to reward you a crown of life. Come to this place and let me pray for you. Would there be someone who will be brave enough to decide to accept Jesus Christ as his Savior? Who wants that someday you will be receiving a crown? Praise God for you, brother. Praise God. Is there anyone else? Is there anyone else? 
who wants to accept Jesus Christ. Please come. Accept Jesus Christ. Receive a new life in Him. He is willing. Remember the agony. Remember the suffering of Jesus Christ on the cross. You know, we are supposed to be crucified, but Jesus Christ took the punishment. He made it possible for us to wear that crown of life. Praise the Lord for you, brother. Thank you. And now, I am calling to those who have accepted Jesus Christ already. Those who are, who are children of Seventh-day Adventist family who wants to recommit their lives. Your life may not have been like that of Daniel or Timothy, who from their childhood experienced to honor God and serve Him with sincerity and faithfulness. But I tell you, you can be like David, and you can be like that prodigal son who came back to his father. Come back to Jesus Christ. Brother, sister, reclaim your crown. And to those parents who cry in their hearts, the same statement that Joshua uttered, and you want to see your family complete in heaven, you want to see them present on that great coronation day, I want you to stand from your seat. Take the responsibility. Recommit your life to Jesus Christ. Now for those who are struggling to make a decision, maybe you are shy, but you've got not to be ashamed. While we are praying here, brothers, sister, friends, you can come and join a group here. Let us pray. Let us bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you have again moved our hearts and our minds to accept Jesus Christ. Here are souls willing to accept your salvation, the crown of life. You have said, you have promised that whoever will come to you, in no wise you will, you will cast out, O oh God. Now we are here, Lord. We want to wear that crown of glory in heaven. We want to be with the family, families who will be there rejoicing, seeing face to face, our Lord Jesus Christ. Out oh, here, Father, are your sons and daughters. We acknowledge our sinfulness, but we would like to begin a new life, and we would like to begin a new heritage of faith. Heavenly Lord, accept us. I pray that the decisions that they have made this morning this will remain on them until tomorrow they will receive a new life in that watery grave of baptism. Heavenly Lord, thank you so much because you have promised us that all of us who are willing can come to you. Lord, forgive us if we have committed sin. We ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.